Good afternoon, Memorial Baptist friends and family, and welcome back to our midweek edition of our podcast for August 5th, 2020. I hope everyone is having a a great week this week. We had such a, a blessing last Sunday afternoon, passing out VBS curriculum, Vacation Bible School curriculum, to parents who were participating in our virtual family vacation Bible school called Knights of North Castle. They're participating in that all this week. Um, I think it's a wonderful thing. Uh, As always, our children's minister, Casey Jumper, um, had things very well organized uh, for a socially distanced and smooth handoff uh, to parents of the 100-plus children who were pre-registered. It was so great to see their excitement as we elevated our ministry to their children through this event. Moms and dads were able to stay cool in the air conditioning of their vehicles as they drove through five different stations in our parking lot to be handed care packages, instructions, and craft kits from masked up and cheerful volunteers. Thank you to everyone who helped distribute the Word of God. Y'all are the salt of the earth. I just want to give a quick shout out uh, to uh, Braden Tanner. Uh, he had his uh, staff anniversary this uh, past weekend, and um, I'm just so thankful for Braden and Caroline and, and Hattie um, and Georgia and all that they do uh, for our college students, but also for our church. And what a blessing it is uh, that they are here and on staff, and we're just delighted about that. So. Uh, thank you for the, uh, the last two years of ministry uh, that we've enjoyed with you, Braden. What a blessing you are. You know, we continue to meet at Memorial for our Sunday morning worship service at 1045 a.m. each Sunday morning. We had a very blessed Lord's Day this past Sunday. Our worship team did another great job leading us in worship. Corey and Skyler, Casey and Hannah, thank you for giving your time, your talents, and your very best to our God, because He and He alone is worthy of our praise. This Sunday, I'll be continuing in chapter 1 of the book of James, preaching about religion that God acknowledges. I hope to see you there this Sunday. You know, we are continuing to monitor and evaluate our community and and, uh, the area as we seek God's wisdom with respect to our ministry at Memorial. Due to the continued climb of COVID cases uh, in our area, we, as we continue to meet for worship on Sundays, we will be social distancing, we will be masking up and hand sanitizing as, as necessary protocols. We're also hosting a midweek prayer service on Wednesdays at 6 p.m. And Brother Jeff is leading a time for our youth to get together on six, at 6 p.m. on Wednesdays as well. At this point, we do not have any children's ministry on Sunday morning or Wednesday evenings. We will continue to, with our current pattern, and our leadership will meet every couple of weeks to revisit and update our reopening plan. As we are safely able to do so, we will continue to seek to add more ministry uh, for our church. As I have said before, if you have questions or concerns, please call us. I know it's not easy for any of us, and we're trying to keep our people and our most vulnerable ones safe as we open up. And um, If you have questions or concerns, just call us. Each of us should assess our, our risk individually and in relation to our families. And please exercise the freedom and good sense to do what you need to do, extending grace to others as they do the same thing. Now, before we jump into our scripture passage for this afternoon, I'd like to pray together. And if you would, pray with me while I lead us in prayer. Loving Father and everlasting God, I just want to thank you, Father, for who you are and all that you do. I thank you for sustaining us each and every day. I thank you for loving us. I thank you for waking us up this morning and given us bread to eat. Father, I want to thank you for all the meals that we've ever eaten. Father, what a blessing it is to to call you our Father. 
Lord, I just want to lift up our homebound to you. Father, those who uh, maybe can't get out or shouldn't get out, and um, I just pray, Father, for uh, your presence in this time of loneliness, in this time of being apart from everyone and not being able to uh, enjoy being loved on by others. I just pray, Father, that you would bless them. Father, that they would sense your presence with them even now. Father, wherever they are, in a care facility, in their home, in an apartment, God, that you would just be there with them during this time, that they would sense your presence. Father, I lift up those who are struggling those who are suffering with this coronavirus. I pray, Father, that you would bring healing to them and, Father, that you would restore them. Father, I think of people from our own church family that are suffering from this. I pray for healing. Lord, I ask for all those that are working and serving in the front lines, Father, those that are in the trenches, those nurses and doctors, those who are caring for those who uh, have contracted this virus, I pray that you would bless them, give them wisdom. Father, that you would protect them from catching it. Father, that you would be honored and glorified in their, their care for others. Lord, I want to thank you for this country that we live in. I want to lift up all of our teachers who are heading back to school or going through a professional development and learning about what it's going to look like online and other ways, learning what it's going to look like when students come back. But Father, I pray that you would give them your wisdom and protect them. Uh, Father, all the teachers in the the different ISDs, uh, independent school districts around here, I think of the the teachers in, in Colleen, I, I, I pray for the teachers in, in the Belton School District, in the Temple School District, the Academy School District, Rogers, Troy, all of them around Holland. Father, I pray that you would give them wisdom as they seek to do what's best for our children and our students. I ask, Father, that you would protect our students as we send them back to school. Father, as we bring some sense of normalcy uh, to this crazy year that we're in, I pray, Father, for courage. I pray for strength. I pray for healing. I pray for protection. Father, for our military uh, that's around the world protecting our freedoms, I ask God that you would be with them in a very special way, that you would help them, Father, as they protect us. um, I pray, Father, for their protection. Father, that you would fight their battles for them. Father, I pray for the families of those that have lost uh, loved ones recently. I pray, Father, that you would be with those families as they um, bury their young Marines and sailors, and I pray, Father, that you would bless them. Father, I can't even imagine just the heartbreak, Father, of learning that their loved one has has perished. So I ask, Father, that you would guide them and bless them. I pray for our police. I pray for our first responders. Father, in a day and an age when they are under attack, I pray that you would strengthen them and give them resolve, give them courage, uh, Father, to protect human life. And and Father, I know that that there are mistakes made by many. Uh, Father, we are all sinners and we're all tainted by sin. But I pray, Father, for our police force. I pray that you would uh, just guide them and that you would intercede for them, loving Father. Uh, that you would guard their backs, have their have their backs, Father. And I just pray that you would just help us as we um, honor them for their call, their service, their dedication. I thank you, Father, for our police, our military. I thank you for all of those who provide protection. 
and assistance when we need it. Father, I lift up our church. I I pray for our ministries here at Memorial. I I pray for our church staff. I ask that you would uh, protect them from the virus. But I also ask, Father, that you would give them wisdom in knowing how to minister online and in other ways in these crazy days that we live in, uh, that you would give them your wisdom to minister, um, to meet the needs of our people, whether that be our, our young people, our students, our children, our seniors, whoever that might be, Father, I, I pray that you would minister uh, through our ministers. Thank you, Father, for doing that. Thank you for calling them to ministry and preparing them uh, for what's next. And so I ask God that you would bind our hearts together, that we would have a, uh, a very uh, resilient uh, call, a Father, that is steeped in courage and power through you and through your word and through your Holy Spirit. Um, Father, help us to not shrink back. But Father, in the day of persecution, to stand firm. Father, these are our prayers, that we stand firm when our hour of persecution comes. Thank you, Father, for loving us. I do pray, Father, for sweeping revival. Father, that you would pour your Spirit out among your people across this nation, in your churches. Father, among your servants, that you would just pour your Spirit out. And, and Father, that you would do this for your glory and for your honor. Father, we are so blessed to call you our Father. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your sacrifice. It is our joy to serve you and to serve your body. Holy Spirit, I ask for an a indwelling, an infilling of your Holy Spirit, that you would um, help us to know exactly what your Spirit is calling us to do each and every day, that we would be doers of the Word and not hearers only. Father, thank you for this time together, and I pray that everyone listening would be blessed because of your word. Father, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This afternoon we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 9. If you have your scripture and would open it up to Hebrews chapter 9. And um, we're going to read uh, probably down through verse 10 or so uh, this afternoon. But, you know, in chapter 8... We finished up last week, and and, uh, chapter 8 ends with the ominous words, um, but whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. See, it was the Holy Spirit. It was that the Holy Spirit who inspired these words prepared the minds of the Jewish disciples for the disappearance of their venerated religious system which came to pass within a very few years of the destruction of Jerusalem. The temple being destroyed, the priesthood slain, the sacrifices stopped. Judaism has become but the pale and bloodless shadow of its former self. And in itself, and at its very best, it was only a shadow of good things to come. I want to read in Hebrews chapter 9, beginning in verse 1 and reading down through verse 5. It says, Now even the first covenant had regulations of divine worship and the earthly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle prepared, the outer one, in which were the lampstand and the table and the sacred bread. This is called the holy place. Behind the second veil was the tabernacle, which is called the Holy of Holies, having a golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, which was in which was a golden jar holding the manna and Aaron's rod, which budded in the tables of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. But of these things we cannot now speak in detail. You know, in this passage and reviewing this passage and studying it, I've greatly benefited from Stephen Cole's study on this passage, and I believe that you will too. So there may be some of that thrown in here, but um, 
I didn't come up with this myself, but I understand that uh, we can. Uh, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We also need to be wise, and and um, we can learn from other people's um, excavation of the passage, if you will. You know, our society has thrown out guilt. You know, as a as a bad carryover, if you will, from from our Puritan past. You know, movie stars and celebrities not only cast off their guilt, but also go on TV to boast about their shameful deeds. Even Christians who have fallen into sin explain how they have come to feel good about themselves in spite of their failures. They complain about self-righteous, judgmental Christians who won't accept their shortcomings. And yet, in spite of our widespread efforts to suppress or deny guilt, we just can't quite seem to shake it. You know, years ago, psychologist Eric Fromm, he he observed, it is indeed amazing that in as fundamentally irreligious a culture as ours, the sense of guilt should be so widespread and deep-rooted as it is. You know, I think there's a cartoon that kind of hit the nail on the head. It showed a psychologist studying his patient. And he said, Mr. Figby, I think I can explain your feelings of guilt. You're guilty. (laughs) You know, the Bible declares that all of us are guilty before the bench of God's holy justice. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. See, the Bible teaches that guilt is more than just a bad feeling. It is true moral culpability that alienates us from God and brings us under His decreed penalty. Eternal punishment in the lake of fire, according to Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. But thankfully, the Bible also declares that God has provided a remedy for our guilt. It is vital that we understand and apply this remedy personally. See, the Hebrew Christians were tempted to leave the Christian faith and return to Judaism. The author here is showing them why that would be spiritually fatal. The Old Covenant under Moses was inferior to the New Covenant that Jesus initiated. The Levitical priests under the Old Covenant were sinful, mortal men. As contrasted with Jesus, our sinless priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. You see, in our text, he shows that the Old Covenant sacrificial system was temporary and imperfect. It could not provide a clean conscience for the worshipers. God designed that old system to point ahead to the superior final sacrifice of our high priest, Christ, who offered his own blood to obtain for us eternal redemption and a clean conscience. So the author of Hebrews' point is that God's remedy for guilt is the blood of Christ. Have you ever wondered why God gave Moses such explicit instructions on setting up the tabernacle? I mean, there are a couple of basic reasons. The first reason is that the tabernacle was where God had fellowship with Israel. You know, Exodus 25 verse 8 says, And let them construct a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them. God dwelt in the tabernacle. There the Shekinah glory of the dwelling glory presence of God was with Israel. It was God's house, and the building of it would be by His direction. The second reason is that the whole of the tabernacle was a type, a symbol, or a shadow pointing forward to the reality of Jesus Christ. You know, back in chapter 8, verse 5, it says, Who serve a copy 
and shadow of the heavenly things, just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to erect the tabernacle for see, he says, that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. See, the tabernacle pointed to Christ. For instance, the tabernacle was the presence of the Shekinah glory in Israel's midst, but this merely prefigured Christ who would come to dwell among men. You know, in John chapter 1, verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the word dwelt is, is also the word for tabernacled. The Word became flesh and tabernacled among us. Christ literally tabernacled among us because God's presence was in the person of Jesus Christ dwelling among men. See, every aspect of the tabernacle somehow pointed forward to Christ. And the author of the book of Hebrews mentions only a few of the articles of, of the furniture that is in the tabernacle, was in the tabernacle. And the reason for mentioning only a few articles is that these articles deal with the present ministry of Christ. The author said he did not have time to elaborate on these pieces of furniture. But, but we do. We do a little bit. And today I plan on uh, taking the six pieces of furniture in the tabernacle and show how they point forward to Christ in His person and in His work. See, it's my uh, conviction that each article, each piece of furniture is designed uh, to teach some significant lesson about Christ. And while it's possible to take all the details of all the furniture, you know, the, the horns, the knobs, the grates, etc., and, and see how they point to Christ, this often degenerates into um, uh, type, typolog- excuse me, typological confusion and endless subjectivity. You know, we, we get confused about the symbols and this and that. But God designed the old sacrificial system as a temporary imperfect way of pointing ahead to Jesus Christ. See, these verses in chapter 9, verses 1 through 10, they kind of fall in two categories, two sections, if you will. The first one, verses 1 through 5, God designed the earthly tabernacle as a picture of Christ. You know, John MacArthur, in his New Testament commentary, he points out that the Bible only devotes two chapters to the story of creation, but it gives about 50 chapters to the tabernacle. It was the center of Jewish worship under the Old Covenant. And the author mentions the tabernacle rather than the temple because the tabernacle was introduced immediately after the Old Covenant was instituted. Also, the tabernacle was obviously more temporary than the temple, which fits the author's point here. As we saw in chapter 8, verse 5, the design of the tabernacle and its worship, it wasn't left up to human ideas. But God revealed everything in detail to Moses on the mountain. And the whole thing was an Old Testament portrait of Jesus Christ. See, the author omits any references to the courtyard, which contains the bronze altar for sacrifices and the bronze laver Uh, or basin. His purposes center on the tabernacle itself because he wants to compare and contrast it with the true tabernacle in heaven where Jesus entered into the very presence of God. Let's cover briefly the, the plan of the tabernacle. Okay, the tabernacle, if you remember, this tent like structure was surrounded by a fenced outer court, which was 150 feet long and 75 feet wide. And any Jew could come into the outer court and had to do so if he was to offer an animal sacrifice for sins. Notice, however, there was only one door into the tabernacle. And if the Jew was to have fellowship with God, he had to go through the gate. See, Jesus Christ is the only door 
for salvation. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verses 7 and 9, he says, Jesus therefore said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he shall be saved, and he shall go in and out and find pasture. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. See, in the outer court, there were two pieces of furniture, the the brazen altar and the laver. Now, the word laver is the one we get lavatory from. It's a place of washing. It's a place of, uh, of washing up. Uh, the actual tabernacle itself was 45 feet long and 16 feet wide, and it was divided into two parts, the holy place and the holy of holies. Only one who was a priest could enter the holy place, and the holy place in the holy place were three articles of furniture, three pieces. On the right was the ta- table of showbread. On the left was the lampstand. And directly in front of the entrance into the Holy of Holies was the altar of incense. Now there was also a veil that divided the holy place from the Holy of Holies. And the Holy of Holies could only be entered into once a year by the high priest on the Day of Atonement, where atonement was made for the sins of the people. In the Holy of Holies there was the Ark of the Covenant with the mercy seat upon it. And the mercy seat had two golden cherubim, angels, if you will, overlooking the mercy seat. Let's talk briefly about the brazen altar. See, a Jew could enter the outer court through the gate to make a sacrifice for his sins. Any Israelite could come to the brazen altar, but no further. An animal sacrifice, usually a lamb, was put to death and sacrificed, and this was done as an object lesson to the Jew that no one could approach God without the shedding of blood of a perfect sacrifice. Every sacrifice had to be without blemish, or it was rejected. The Jew understood that this sacrifice was only temporary substitution or covering until the Messiah should come and suffer for their sins. The brazen altar typifies or symbolizes or foreshadows Christ's death for sin and for sinners. Christ's blood was shed to deliver a person from the guilt and the penalty of sin. Christ died as a sinner's substitute and his death did not merely cover sin, but it took it away forever. John 1, 29, John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Even in in this chapter, verse 28, it says, So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await Him. See, the fire on the brazen altar, which never went out, speaks of the fires of judgment which Christ bore for all who trust in Him. Christ's blood was shed and His sinless body was given as a human sacrifice that sinners could have the forgiveness of our sins. Hebrews 9.22 says, Without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. Ephesians 1.7 says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. You see, the death of Christ makes it possible for a person to be justified before a holy God. Romans 3.24 says, Being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. And even in Colossians 1.13 and 14 it says, For He delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. See, a Jew could only go to the brazen altar and no further, and this is typical of Christ our salvation who takes away our sins. The outer court and the brazen altar speak of salvation. Only a priest could go into the holy place. And this speaks of service. See, a sinner has to be saved and become a priest before he can serve God. Today, each Christian 
is a priest and can serve God. 1 Peter 1 9 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. Christ, in his sacrificial death and through his high priesthood, made it possible for each of us to serve God. So, on to the, the next article of furniture, the next piece. It's called the laver. Only a priest could go to the laver, which was made of brass and made in the shape of a bowl. I mean, I, I like to think of it like a, a huge bird bath. This bowl was filled with water and a priest could never go into the holy place to do his service for God unless he had first cleansed, him, cleansed himself at the laver. The priest only washed his hands and feet, indicating this is dealing with daily sanctification and holiness and not salvation. The laver speaks of Christ our sanctification. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water by, by the word. Ephesians 5, 25 and 6. See, only one who is a believer could come to the laver for cleansing and has to be cleansed by Christ if he is going to have a vital relationship and fellowship with God and dynamic service for God. The labor shows the great need of Christ's death to deliver the Christian from the power of sin in our lives. We need cleansing to serve God. And 1 John 1, 7 and 9 says, And the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we confess our sin, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, we Christians are a royal priesthood and we must be constantly bringing our sins to Christ for cleansing if we want power to do service. We cannot live in this world without some dirt and defilements of this world. If we do not daily go to Christ for cleansing, we lose our testimony to the world. The next article of furniture is the lampstand. The priest would enter into the holy place cleansed and ready to do service for God. On the left was the lampstand, which had seven branches with the middle shaft a little taller than the others. And this was the only light in the whole tabernacle. And without this light, a priest could never serve God in the tabernacle because he could not see. Priests needed the lampstand to guide them in their service for God. See, the lampstand prefigures Christ who is our light. Again, therefore, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. John eight twelve, Ephesians 5, 8 says, For you, Christians, were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. Here we see Christ is our shining. He's the brightness. Christ gives light to every believer, every believer priest, in that he leads and guides in our service for God. God expects all true believers in Christ to serve him and to do it in the dependence upon Christ who is our light. See, we cannot serve Christ by our own wisdom, by our own ingenuity and strength, but we have to be dependent upon Christ to be our light, and this light is found through God's word. If true Christians are to be lights, they must be resting upon the capital L light of Jesus Christ. In Matthew 5, Jesus said, Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. Philippians 2.15 says, That you may prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. See, all the light that men need to live spiritually is found in Christ. A person cannot know the guiding light of Christ unless he has first gone to the brazen altar of salvation and to the labor for cleansing. Then we begin to experience Christ as a guiding light. The next article of furniture there, the piece of furniture, is the table of showbread. The table of showbread was on the right of the was on the right of the holy place. And on this table were twelve loaves arranged in two rows. 
And this bread was eaten by the priest who served in the tabernacle. And the 12 loaves of bread were a constant reminder to Israel of the covenant relationship in which God would be totally faithful to sustain his people. See, the table of showbread speaks of Christ our sustainer. Christ is the bread of life who sustains his people. I mean, Jesus himself said that. He said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. John 6, 35. Christ satisfies the deepest longings of the human heart so that men will not spiritually hunger. Christ is the spiritual food of God's covenanted people, and he alone brings satisfying communion and fellowship. Just as the Old Testament priests nibbled on the bread all day long and the bread was replaced on each Sabbath, so Christians are to be walking all day long with Christ and His presence must ever be fresh. See, Christ can only fulfill the innermost longings of the human heart if we have first gone to the altar for salvation and the laver for cleansing. We will not feed upon Christ until our attitudes are straight and any and all bad attitudes must be cleansed by Christ. Then we hunger for Christ when we are right with Christ. See, the altar of incense, right in front of that veil that separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place was the golden altar of incense. And on this altar, incense was burned both morning and evening, which represented the sweet fragrance of our prayers offered up to God. The offer of incense symbolizes Christ, our intercessor. Christ is forever praying for his people before the Father in heaven. I love this because it it says in, in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1, Now the main point in what has been said is this, We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Hence, he is also able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. That's found in Hebrews 7.25. So Christ is praying for his people, and because of his prayer, each true believer will persevere to the end and be saved. Each believer priest in his service for Christ can rest assured that Christ is praying for him. This should be a great encouragement to us to keep from despondency in persecution, but also in our failures. See, the author of Hebrews seems to put the altar of incense in the the Holy of Holies. But the explanation given is that when the veil is pulled back, it appeared as though the altar of incense was in the Holy of Holies. Also, the author wants to connect Christ's atoning work at the cross and his intercessory work in heaven. See, the only piece of furniture that's in the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant. And in the Ark were three things, the the tables, the tablets, if you will, of stone that the Mosaic Law was written on. There was a golden pot of manna, and then Aaron's rod that budded. These all had great significance to to Israel. You know, on the ark was the mercy seat, which had two golden angels, the cherubim, on each side looking down on the mercy seat. It was at the ark and the golden mercy and the mercy seat that the Shekinah glory dwelled. Now, once a year, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies with a a bowl of blood from an animal sacrifice, and the blood was to be poured on the mercy seat. And and in order to appease or satisfy the wrath of God um, for sins of ignorance committed by Israel. And on the, the Day of Atonement was a dramatic moment for Israel. The people would watch an animal killed and the blood taken by the high priest into the tabernacle. And the high priest would move through the holy place and stand before the veil into the holy of holies. Then he would push back the veil. Surely he would be frightened, anxious, nervous. For he would know, he did not know what he would meet behind the veil. Slowly he would make his way move towards the the mercy seat. 
having a cord tied to one leg in case he should make a mistake and God would strike him dead. The other priests could then at least pull him out of the Holy of Holies without entering into it themselves. Then the high priest would pour the blood on the mercy seat, knowing that the sins of Israel were covered for another year. He would then move out of the Holy of Holies and through the holy place out into the court where multitudes of Jews were anxiously waiting to see if their sins had been covered for another year. Now the Ark of the Covenant, it measured about 45 inches long, about 27 inches wide, and 27 inches high, which contained in earliest times a golden jar of manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments. The covering of the ark was called the mercy seat, and that is the place of propitiation, the place of substitution, if you will. It was overshadowed by the two cherubim of glory, so-called because it was there that the glory of God's presence was manifested. And the high priest would sprinkle the blood of the sacrifices on this mercy seat. Um, The ark pictured the very presence of God. The golden jar of manna shows Christ as the daily bread for his people. Aaron's rod that budded shows Christ the branch chosen above others because he alone is life-giving. The tables of the covenant reveal God's holy standards. Neither the pot of manna nor Aaron's rod existed in Solomon's time, but the two stone tablets were still there. The ark itself apparently disappeared when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple in 586 B.C. The later temple only contained a stone slab in the Holy of Holies. Notice the author moves on in our passage to describe the familiar tabernacle ritual. Verse 6 and following says this, it says, Now, when these things have been so prepared, the, the priests are continually entering the outer tabernacle, performing the divine worship. But into the second, only the high priest enters once a year, not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing which is a symbol for the present time. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience since they relate only to food and drink and various washings, regulations uh, for the body imposed until the time of reformation. That's through verse 10. See, God designed the ministry of the priest in the tabernacle as a picture of the work of Christ. He summarizes the common activities of the priests in, in verse 6. He went on in, uh, They went into the outer tabernacle to trim the lamps and to put fresh incense on the altar. Once a week they would replace the sacred loaves of bread. But verse 7 focuses on the Holy of Holies. And only the high priest could go in there once a year on the Day of Atonement. He would first offer a bull for his own sin. He would enter the Holy of Holies, sprinkle the blood of the bull on the mercy seat and in front of it. And then he would go back and slaughter one of two goats as a sin offering for the people and take this blood into the mercy seat. He would go back out and lay his hand on the living goat, confessing over it the sins of the people. They would lead this goat out into the wilderness and let it go. It's where we get our word scapegoat from. Just a couple more things and I'll be through. You know, the author calls attention to the fact that the old system provided a way for forgiveness for the sins of the people that were committed in ignorance. The law stipulated that there was no sacrifice for sins of defiance. Numbers 15, 30, and 31. There's a sense, of course, in which Virtually all of our sins stem from defiance toward God, but the reference in Numbers seems to refer to outrageous, blasphemous behavior that represented revolt or treason against God. And in this sense, there is a parallel in Hebrews 10, verse 26 uh, through 31, where the author strongly warns his readers against apostasy. 
for which there is no sacrifice. The Day of Atonement that happened once a year, that ritual would have underscored to Israel a number of vital spiritual truths. It portrayed the absolute holiness of God and how our sin separates us from entering His presence. It showed the sin and defilement of all the people, including the high priest. It showed that no one dared to enter God's holy presence without the blood of an acceptable sacrifice. It showed that the people must approach God through the proper mediator, the high priest. It showed that if the proper sacrifice was offered, God would be propitiated or satisfied so that he would not judge their sins. But as glorious as all of this ritual was, it was inadequate for two main reasons. The first one is the old system provided limited access to God. None of the people, not even all the priests, could enter the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest could go there, and that only once a year with blood. It was not a cozy place where he put his feet up on the hearth and had a warm conversation with God. That's not what we're talking about here. He had to make sure that he had the ritual down perfect or it would be his last trip into that sacred sanctuary. The author attributes the Old Testament account to the Holy Spirit who was signifying that the way into the holy place had not yet been disclosed until the first tabernacle is still standing. See, some understand first tabernacle to refer to the entire tabernacle, but since the same phrase is used in verse 2 and 6 to refer to the holy place, others take it to refer to the outer or first room of the tabernacle. The meaning then would be that the holy place was blocking the way into the sanctuary of God's presence for the mass of the people, for whom entry even into the holy place was prohibited. So so long then as the holy place continued standing, they had no hope of immediate access to God. Secondly, the old system provided limited ability of the sacrifices. I mean, the author's bottom line is that these gifts and sacrifices could not make the, the worshiper perfect in conscience. Verse 9. He does not explain exactly what that means, except that it was a symbol, uh, maybe a parable for the present time. The present time may mean the time then present, that is, in the Old Testament days, the way to God was not yet revealed, or it may mean that the time now present, indicating that the real meaning of the tabernacle can only now be understood in light of the work of Christ. See, the inability of the sacrifices to make the worshiper perfect in conscience did not mean that that no Old Testament saint ever had a clear conscience, but that he did not obtain it by the sacrifices as such. See, the the author offers two reasons for this statement. First, there were external regulations for the body, but the implication is they could not deal adequately with the conscience. And second, they were temporary imposed for a time until a time of reformation which refers to the time of Christ the fact that the sacrifices had to be repeated annually show the incomplete nature of the forgiveness it put off guilt each year but it had to be done again and again up to this point the author is arguing that the old testament sacrificial system was not god's complete and final provision for the guilt of our sin it all pointed ahead to Christ. See, Christ is the fulfillment of the Ark of the Covenant. God dwelled in the tabernacle, but now God dwells in Christ. The tables of the law were fulfilled perfectly by Christ. The pot of manna tells us that Christ came down from heaven and fulfills the needs of his people. Aaron's rod that budded speaks of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. The mercy seat speaks of Christ our satisfaction. See, Christ, through his death on the cross, satisfied once and for all and forever God's holy wrath against sin. His blood atoned for the sins of God's people. Christ is our mercy seat. Christ and his death is the only meeting place between God and man. And God only forgives sin and holds back wrath from those who are covered by the blood of his Son, Jesus Christ. So a true believer in Christ never needs to fear God's wrath because Christ propitiated, he satisfied that wrath in his death. And with God's wrath appeased, we can now commune with 
and fellowship with and worship the one true and living God through Christ Jesus. The end of the salvation process is that we might worship God. See, the symbolism in the teaching of the tabernacle is marvelous. The outer court was the place of salvation. The holy place was the place of service as believers. And the holy of holies is a place of fellowship and worship. And this is all possible through Jesus Christ, who is the fulfillment of everything in the tabernacle. Wow. What a mouthful. (laughs) But I want to thank you so much for tuning in. Next week, we're going to continue in our study in in, in the book of Hebrews. Um, Until we see each other, I just want to say stay safe, practice good hygiene, stay studied up in God's Word, eat well, get some exercise. Whatever you do, give God all the praise and glory and honor that is due His name. We hope to see you all very soon. God bless you.